Welcome back to our study on biblical womanhood. We'd like to begin today by just a few moments of review. To begin our study on biblical womanhood, we went back to the very beginning of time in the first few chapters of Genesis where we discovered God's original plan for men and women in creation. He designed the man to be a loving protector, provider, and leader for his family and the woman to be a submissive helper. This plan in no way was, was in no way altered by the fall of mankind into sin. However, the presence of sin, as well as the subsequent curse on sin, made these divinely designed roles for men and women more difficult to joyfully carry out. Well, in our last meeting, we left the lush, pristine garden where Adam and Eve had enjoyed unhindered fellowship with one another and with the Lord, and fast forwarded 3,000 years in time to a completely different era in history with a totally different culture and surroundings. We found ourselves inside a royal castle in ancient Israel, reading the words that a loving and wise mother had shared with her son who had been crowned as king. It's amazing to realize as we read these beautifully penned words that although so many things had changed, the Lord's master plan for men and women in their respective roles had not changed at all. We're told in the first verse of Proverbs 31 that the following words were the instruction of King Lemuel's mother to, his, to her son. The next eight verses covered the, the basics of leadership. And then in verses 10 through 31, King Lemuel's mother described the type of wife that he should pursue. I believe every Christian woman would demonstrate great wisdom if this is the type of woman she would seek to become. And every Christian man would exhibit great wisdom if this is the type of woman that he would pursue for a wife. Well, let's look more co closely at the character qualities this young king was instructed to look for. And as we read, Ask the Lord to grow us as his daughters in these virtues. If you have your Bible with you, turn with me once again to Proverbs 31, beginning in verse 10. Proverbs 31, 10. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from her far. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. She considers a field and buys it. From her profits, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hand holds the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. When I was a younger woman and my eyes were better, I used to like to cross stitch. Cross stitch is a form of sewing or counted thread embroidery in which small, X-shaped stitches are used to form a picture. 
when I was expecting my last baby in 1988, I had a very difficult pregnancy and I had to be off of my feet a lot. So during that time, I cross-stitched a, a fairly large pattern of Proverbs 31. While all four of my children were still at home and the older ones were in their teen years, I told them that someday I would like for each of them to have one of the four large cross-stitch cross pieces that I had done. While our oldest son, to my surprise, immediately spoke up and said, well, I want the Proverbs 31 pattern. And that puzzled me. So I asked him, son, why would you as a young man want that one? And he replied, well, if I ever get married, I want my wife to read it every day. Well, he's still not married, so that may have something to do with it. But in all seriousness, we who are mothers of adult sons certainly want them to pursue godly wives. And we want our daughters to grow up into these kind of women. But first and foremost, we should seek to become Proverbs 31 women ourselves. The very first thing we're told about this remarkable woman is of her great value. Verse 10 tells us that her worth is far above rubies. I often wondered why her value was compared to rubies rather than diamonds until as I was homeschooling my boys, one day we were studying science together. They were learning about gems and their science book said that while rubies are not the most expensive of the gems, they are the rarest or one of the rarest. And when we read that, it almost immediately struck me, this thought, perhaps that's why the Bible compares the worth of a virtuous woman to rubies, because they are such precious and rare gems. Well, one reason this woman was so valuable, valuable was because of her loyalty and her honesty. Verse 11 tells us that her husband's heart trusted in her. He didn't jealously guard her or hide his valuables from her. He knew that she would always do him good, whether he was at home or away, whether he was in health or in sickness, whether his business prospered or it failed, this woman would stand by him. She would help him and always do what was in his best interest. He could confide in her with confidence, knowing that she would not disclose his private matters to others. The second part of verse 11 says, so he will have no lack of gain. Her frugality and hard work would only add to his wealth. The 17th century English devotional commentator Matthew Henry said this about these verses. She makes it her constant business to do him good. She shows her love to him by giving him good words and not bad ones studying to make him easy, to provide what is fit for him both in health and in sickness, and attending him with diligence and tenderness when anything ails him. Nor would she know, not for the world, do anything that might be a damage to his person, family, estate, or reputation. And this her care all the days of her life, not at first only or now and then when she's in a good humor, but perpetually. This godly wife was loyal, honest, and trustworthy. The author of the book, A Woman After God's Own Heart wrote, God's beautiful wife is intent on lavishing every possible good upon her husband. She lives to love him, and so she does him good at every opportunity. Verse 12 tells us that not only does she do him good, but she does not do any evil toward him. This means that she doesn't cause him unnecessary distress, trouble, harm, or misery. She doesn't give in to selfishness, anger, and make life difficult for him at home. No, she chooses to follow after God's plan to do her husband good and not evil all the days of her life. So we can see that after 3,000 years of history and many major changes in the world, God's plan for women didn't change at all. His intention was still for godly women to be submissive helpers to their husbands. Well, not only was this amazing woman loyal and honest, 
but we also see over and over again in these 22 verses that she was industrious and disciplined. I mean, she makes me tired just reading about her. She made wise purchases. She planted food for her family and rose while it was still dark to prepare it. She was up late at night spinning thread, dyeing and weaving cloth and making clothing for them. She made goods to sell in the marketplace. She took care of her servants and also cared for the poor. How did this woman accomplish so much? Well, one reason she was able to accomplish so many things is because she was busy from sun up to sundown. She wasn't out late at night socializing or wasting hours on social media or television, nor was she sleeping till noon. We don't see any hint of laziness or slothfulness in this woman's life. And it's obvious that her first priority was her family. She worked hard to make sure that all their needs were taken care of. One thing I love about this lady is her attitude. She didn't just look after her responsibilities because she had to. Verse 13 says she willingly worked with her hands. The Hebrew word means she literally worked with pleasure or delight. It seems that she joyfully put her whole heart into her work. Years ago, I heard a pastor friend of ours tell this true story. He said that he was sitting in his chair in the living room studying over his notes for his message the following morning, which was a Sunday morning. And his little girl walked over to the arm of his chair and looked up at him and said, Papa, do you have to preach tomorrow? And he smiled and replied to her, Honey, I don't have to preach. I get to preach. And that's how I feel. As a Christian wife, mother, and grandmother, I don't have to cook and clean and do laundry for my husband. I get to serve him. I'm very aware that one day I may no longer have that opportunity. I don't have to spend time with and care for my children and my grandchildren. I get to serve my dear family, and I thank the Lord for that privilege. I didn't grow up in a Christian home, and my mother had to work outside of the home the entire time I was growing up. So when Dawn and I married, I was so thrilled to be marrying a man who loved the Lord and loved me. I was excited that I would not have to hold down a secular job while trying to care for a family. I wasn't bored when we read the scriptures together and prayed together. No, it brought such joy to my heart. I knew that it was a tremendous blessing from the Lord to have a godly husband to care for to cook and clean and wash clothes for. And it was a blessing that we had clothes and we had food and we had a home. And then when God blessed us with children, I was so grateful for those little undeserved blessings. Now, does that mean that I never grumbled or whined or complained? No, not at all. But I think if my husband were here, he could testify that Overall, I thoroughly enjoyed serving alongside him, caring for our home and training our children. There was no place I would have rather been and no occupation I would have rather had. Well, this lady thought ahead to make sure that all the needs of her family were met. There was no reason for her to be anxious because she had already made warm clothing for them. The Hebrew word translated as scarlet in verse 21 is probably not referring to color. It literally means double thickness. And that's why she didn't need to be concerned about the snow because she had made warm clothing for all of her family. And I want you to notice that all her household were clothed with these warm clothes. This would of course would include her husband and her children but also very likely aging parents and possibly married children and grandchildren. It wouldn't have been uncommon at all to have orphaned nieces and nephews, widowed relatives or other extended family living in the same home. Her servants would have definitely been included. She made sure that everyone in her household was cared for. 
she truly looked well to the ways of her home, not just glancing over her house once in a while. This lady also oversaw everything that pertained to her household. In verse 27, the word that's translated as ways, she watches over the ways for her household, literally means tracks made by constant use. She made it her business to faithfully take care of all the day-to-day -day business in her family. So there was no room in her life for idleness or laziness. She was busy from sun up to sundown. But we always need to remember that while it's good to keep your house tidy and your family's clothes clean and mended and ironed, it's commendable to cook good nutritious meals and have a well manicured lawn. But we must always remember that the place exists to meet the needs of the people who live there. We need to be careful that in the midst of cooking, cleaning, shopping, and laundry, we remember that the most important thing other than our own personal walk with the Lord is that we listen to and we are available to our family and our loved ones. So this honorable woman carried out her role as a helper to her husband through her loyalty to him as well as her diligence and her hard work. But she wasn't only a faithful companion and a hardworking helper, she was also a kind and compassionate lady Verse 20 says, she extends her hand to the poor, yet she reaches out her hands to the needy. This Im verse implies that she was looking for opportunities to help those who were in need. This woman worked hard for her profits, but not so she could selfishly spend them on herself or waste them on idle pursuits. She used her profits for the benefit of others. She was a very busy lady, taking care of her family, making sure her household was run well and her servants were taken care of, but she still found time to reach out in mercy to the less fortunate. And once again, we see the heart of this woman. She wasn't dutifully carrying out some ministry that had been assigned to her. She was extending a heart of mercy by giving the profits of her wise investments and hard work. Perhaps she made meals, provided warm clothing, or nursed the sick. She wasn't just a helper to her husband and children. She was also a helper to those in need. And the last thing I want us to consider today about this virtuous woman is her role as a true helpmeet. Although she was a hard worker, a wise manager over her home, and a shrewd businesswoman, nowhere do we find her climbing the corporate ladder of success. We never, never see her trying to promote herself. She was pouring her efforts and her resources into making her husband successful. Her husband was a man of influence. He was the one who was known in the gates among the elders of the land, not this incredible woman. In the days when this was written, cities were walled for defense, but the gates allowed people to enter and exit. And these gated entrances contained one or more large rooms built into the city wall. One of those chambers would serve as an official government office where legal decisions would be made, political issues were settled, official proclamations were read, and important business matters were transacted. The city gates were the center of civic and economic life in ancient Israel. This is where the leading men would gather and you know, it seems kind of odd. We have this list of one thing after another that this woman excelled in. And then abruptly we read, her husband was known in the gates among the elders of the land. While right after that, it goes back to listing her accomplishments. Well, I think it reads that way because much of his success was due to the hard work and the help of his wife. Her godly character contributed to his advancement. If you're a married woman, one of the most important responsibilities that you have is to support your husband. In the mid-1800s, Charles Spurgeon, the famous pastor of the Metropolitan London Tabernacle in London, England, found himself in the midst of a thriving ministry. But he became concerned that 
Perhaps he was neglecting his children. So one evening, he returned home earlier than usual and opened the door of his home only to be greeted by silence. He recorded as he ascended the stairs, he heard the voice of his wife, Susanna, and realized that she was praying with the children. When she finished her prayer and her nightly instruction, Mr. Spurgeon thought to himself, I can go on with my work. My children are well cared for. He didn't have to worry that his children were not having their needs met. Susanna once wrote, it was ever the settled purpose of my married life that I should never hinder him, speaking of her husband Charles, from fulfilling his engagements, never pleading my own ill health as a reason why she, he should remain at home with me. I thank God now that he enabled me to carry out this determination and rejoice that I have no cause to reproach myself with being a drag on the swift wheels of his consecrated life. Because of the diligence, faithfulness, and selflessness of Susanna Spurgeon, she gave the world Charles Spurgeon. And we are still to this day being blessed, convicted, and inspired by his words. She also gave us two Spurgeon sons who became preachers of the gospel. Like the husband of the woman in Proverbs 31, Charles Spurgeon praised his excellent wife. This is what he wrote to his precious helpmeet. None know how grateful I am to God for you. In all I have ever done, you have a large share. For in making me so happy, you have fitted me for service. Not an ounce of power has been lost to the good cause through you. I have served the Lord far more and never less for your sweet companionship. Many of you have probably heard the humorous saying, behind every good man is a good woman and a surprised mother-in-law. But that is um, not always the case, but God definitely uses a godly woman to help advance a godly man. So in this most important and beautiful chapter on a model Christian woman, we discover that she was a loyal, hardworking, kind, unselfish, devoted helper to her husband. After many generations since the Garden of Eden, God's plan for men and women had not changed at all. Next time, we're going to look at more of her exemplary character the grateful beneficiaries of her labor and the foundation of all that she was. Until then, dear sisters, may the Lord bless and keep you and grow you in these areas as faithful women of God.